Today we take a look at four absolutely broken builds for Baldur's Gate 3 that come online before or at level four. So I've done a bunch of different build guides for builds that come online super early. Most of them come online in act one and a few of them come online and are completely broken by the time you hit act two. But I wanted to set out to challenge myself and see if there were four builds that would make a complete party that would be absolutely completely broken by level four before you you complete the mission for the Druid Grove and side with either the Druids or the Goblins. This means that all of the items that make some really great builds that are available within the Get Yankee Crash and the Monastery were completely off limits. And this one was indeed a challenge. This took me a couple of days to get this all figured out. There isn't a lot to work with this early on in the game. However, I have come up with some absolutely ridiculous builds that can end up being even more ridiculous if you continue to kit them out and level them. And without further ado, let's get to the first build. This first build is not only absolutely broken, it's also really easy to put together because all you need is levels. You don't even need a weapon for this build. So you're gonna start off with your first level into cleric because clerics are super strong. Pick whichever subdomain you wanna go with, it doesn't really matter. However, I chose the life cleric because it gives me the option to wear any armor that I want to wear as well as increased healing just in case I need to heal. You're going to put 12 points into strength, 16 into dexterity, 14 into constitution, 16 into wisdom, and leave intelligence and charisma at 8. After that, your next three levels are going to go into druid, and for your druid subclass, you're going to pick circle of the land. And then when you get to pick a land, you can pick any of the lands that you want to pick for whichever spells you want to go with. It's not really going to matter because in most cases, you're not going to use any of them. I chose mountain for my setup here because spiked growth is handy and so is mirror image. Now, why did we choose these two classes? Well, they give us access to two incredibly OP spells that work together in a combo that are just ridiculously busted. And that is Sanctuary and Moonbeam. For some reason, Moonbeam doesn't count as damage coming from you. I guess because it's coming from the moon to the point where it won't even proc things that proc or should proc when you do radiant damage. For example, any of the things that put radiating orb on something and require you to do radiant damage in order for that to happen, Moonbeam just doesn't do the thing. That means it also does not break Sanctuary. So this setup is pretty simple. You get into combat, you cast Moonbeam, then you cast Sanctuary on yourself. For 10 turns now, you can move Moonbeam around to wherever you want to move it around to, and you will never break Sanctuary. Nothing can target you, and you just walk around invulnerable to everything, because in most cases, nothing will try to target you except for the goblins in act one for some reason they have the ability to throw stones at you even though you have sanctuary on you but they hit for very little and you can always heal yourself with a healing pot or a healing spell once you hit level four and you have all of your levels and everything that they're supposed to be in you should have four rank one spell slots and three rank two spell slots this means you have a total of 30 turns of moonbeam and sanctuary every long rest you also have two wild shape charges which give you two total separate health pools as well as two natural recovery charges which will allow you to recover one level two spell slot or two level one spell slots so this means that in theory if you wanted to and you spent one of your level two spell slots you could indeed recover that spell slot for a total of 40 turns every long rest of this combo and the damage from moonbeam is pretty significant because every time something starts to turn inside moonbeam it rolls anywhere from two to 20 damage. This next build is one that I have covered many of times and it comes online at level three and it is one of, if not the most broken build in the game due to the fact that it just completely shuts down the AI and that is the fog cloud build. In order to get this build online by level three, your first level is going to be Tempest Cleric. You are going to put 12 points into strength, 16 into dexterity because it is a dexterity build, 16 into constitution, 14 into wisdom because we don't really care about any of our cleric spells. There is only one spell that we want, and that is the Fog Cloud spell, and we also get all kinds of other goodies going through Tempest Cleric that are not reliant on our Wisdom modifier. Later on, if you want to make use of your other cleric abilities, you can move some of those points that are in Constitution over to Wisdom. After that, you are going to put three levels into Rogue, and when you hit your third level in Rogue, you are going to choose Thief. That way, you get two additional bonus actions. Now, the one downside 
downside to this build is you only get 20 turns of fog cloud per long rest. But in most cases, that is enough for at least two fights before you have to take a long rest. Now, I know a bunch of people are going to jump down there in the comments and go, you can do a similar thing with the Warlock, but that build does not come online as early because you need to have the ability to hide inside of the darkness and or fog cloud. And while you can get the darkness ability and darkness sight with the Warlock, the Warlock will not have the ability to hide this early on, which means that you will just have stuff thrown at you inside of the darkness because for some reason, stuff can throw things at you inside the darkness, but you're not allowed to target things inside the darkness. There are a few items that you want to pick up, but they're all super easy to get a hold of and they will help you maximize your damage with this build early on. One of the easiest things to pick up is two hand crossbows. Just go buy them. If you can get a hold of two hand crossbow plus ones, I wasn't able to do that for this video, but it should be a doable thing. The other things you want to pick up are the speedy light feet. These allow you to gain lightning charges, which will increase your damage and add lightning damage to it, as well as the gloves of archery. They will add an additional two damage to each of your shots. The next thing you want to do, and this one is a very important one, is you want to ensure that you toggle dual wield off. Now you're still going to be able to attack with both weapons, but you won't attack with them at the same time. This prevents you from using up your bonus action because there's a specific combo you want to do here in order to maximize your damage. So let's talk about how combat goes down. So when combat starts, you of course cast Fall Cloud and then you step inside of it and you hide. Then you use your cunning action dash if you have the speedy light feet at this point in order to build a lightning charge. Then you pass your turn. Once it rolls back around to your turn, all you are going to do is step to the very edge of the fog cloud just outside of it so that you can see and you're not blinded. You want to ensure that you have line of sight on an enemy and then you are going to use your bonus action using your offhand crossbow in order to perform a ranged attack. If you are not spotted and you are still hidden when you step outside of the fog cloud, use your main hand attack and do a sneak attack. If you are unable to do a sneak attack, which in a lot of cases is probably going to be the case, then you just use your bonus action as I stated and then follow that up with your main action on the same target or another target if you manage to kill that target with your offhand. Then all you have to do is step right back into the fog cloud and use your bonus action to hide. And then you can just rinse and repeat this as necessary using your additional bonus action for an attack or a dash to build lightning charges. And that's the build. It is absolutely the definition of broken. The next build is what I'm referring to as the blur fighter. And this build is kind of hilarious. So you're going to put your first level into fighter. You're going to go 16 strength, 14 dexterity, 16 constitution, and 12 into charisma. For your fighting style, you want to pick defense. This is going to give us plus one bonus to our armor class. Then your next three levels are going to go into sorcerer. When it comes time to pick your subclass, you are going to pick the draconic bloodline, pick whichever dragon you want to pick. It doesn't really matter because we're only here for two things, meta magic and the blur spell. For your meta magics, you want to pick extended spell. That is the important one, as well as twin spell and quicken spell. Now at this point, you should have three sorcery points, four level one spell slots and two level two spell slots. Now let's talk about the items that you want for this because you are going to need a few items. Once you hit level four or somewhere around there, maybe three should be four. I know you can definitely pick it up at four. You want to grab the chainmail plus one. This has an armor class of 17 and it is heavy armor. You also want to make sure you get any old shield at this level. I'm using the safeguard shield. It gives me plus one to saving throws. This will give you an additional two armor class. This puts you at 20 AC. Another weapon that I highly suggest getting, but you don't have to use because it can be a little risky at times is the shattered flail. This allows you to heal when you hit something. So that means that on the off chance that you do manage to get hit, which is going to be hardly ever, you can just heal that right back and you're basically immortal. Another really nice item to pick up here and one that's absolutely hilarious is the gloves of power. This states that when you hit something, it has a chance of inflicting a 1d4 penalty on the target's attack rolls. Basically, every time you hit something, you have a chance of putting Bane on it. This means the target that you're attacking is going to have an even harder time at hitting you. If you really want to take this one step further, and this is just a little bit of a icing on the cake here, you can also have someone in your party. It has to be someone in your party. They don't necessarily have to be out and fighting with you. They just have to be in the group. Have them cast Shield of Faith on you. This will put you at a AC of 22. Now let's talk about how the build works and the reason we picked what we picked. One thing I recommend doing is turning all of your level one spell slots into sorcery 
sorcery points and then using some of those sorcery points to give yourself a third level two spell slot. This leaves you with four sorcery points to spend and three level three spell slots per long rest. When you get into a fight and it's your turn, you are going to use your extended spell meta magic and you are going to cast blur on yourself. This gives everything that tries to attack you disadvantage on its attack. This means that if you've had someone cast shield of faith on you, the target that is attacking you has to manage to roll a 22 with disadvantage. That's nearly impossible for most things to do in act one. So let me give you an idea of just how hard you are to hit. If you don't have shield of faith on and you only have an AC of 20 and the thing that is attacking you does not have any bonuses to its attack roll. It has a one in 400 chance of actually hitting you. That means it's got to roll the dice about 400 times and it may hit you once. Keep in mind that for this to work, you need actual random, real random dice. So make sure you turn karmic dice off. Other than that, the build's pretty easy to play. You walk into a fight, nothing can land a hit on you and you slap them around with your mace. Last but not least, we have the most screwed up of all of these builds and the least-ish OP out of all of them. But if you keep at it, the build's absolutely insanely broken by mid game. This early on in the game, I would only call it semi-broken. This build relies on a very specific set of items and a very specific weapon. And that is the hammer raft. I guess that's how you pronounce that. Don't know, don't really care. You can see it there on the screen, hammer. And it states that when the wearer jumps, they deal one to four thunder damage in a three meter radius upon landing. This cannot be dodged, nothing. It just does the damage to everything around it. From there, we're gonna do anything and everything we can to increase the amount of movement speed that we have so that we can jump as much as possible. So we are also going to get Crusher's Ring, which adds three meters to our movement speed. We want the Spring Step Boots, which state that when we dash, we get momentum for three turns, and the Haste Helm, which states that at the start of combat, we get momentum for three turns. Another very handy item that you want to try to pick up is the Moon Drop Pendant. This states that when the wearer falls below 50% or less HP, they do not provoke attacks of opportunity. Your levels are going to consist of two levels into Fighter and two levels into Monk. Since we're using a two-handed weapon for your fighting style, I would just go with the Great Weapon Fighting just in case you actually decide to attack something for realsies instead of just jumping around. But in most cases, you're just going to be jumping around. For your ability points, you're going to go 12 into Strength, 16 into Dexterity. This is going to help with our initiative, 14 into Constitution, and 16 into Wisdom. If you do not have someone in your party that has the ability to cast Long Strider, I highly recommend going over and picking up a Hireling, specking them into one of the many different classes that get the Long Strider spell, and making sure that you cast it on this character every single day. That gives you an additional three meters of move speed. When a fight breaks out and it becomes your turn, hopefully it starts out as your turn and nothing else will ever get to take a turn. The first thing you want to do is use Step of the Wind Dash. This will make it so that any of the jump actions that you do only cost you move speed. The next thing you want to do is your normal dash. Then you want to use your action surge. Then you want to use your normal dash again. When it's all said and done, you should have around 102 movement speed. Now what you want to do is just start jumping until everything is dead. One of the beautiful things about this build is a short rest completely refreshes everything. Now there is an item that you can pick up in Act 1, but it doesn't fit within the confines of my challenge here. But I do want to point it out because it is really insane on this build. And that is the Gloves of Belligerent Skies. This can be picked up in the Inquisitor's Chamber of the Githyanki Kresh. And they state that whenever the wearer deals thunder damage, lightning damage, or radiant damage, it inflicts two turns of reverberation upon the target. You do thunder damage in a massive AoE and reverberation gives the targets a negative one penalty to dexterity, strength, and constitution saving throws per each stack that they have. Once they hit five stacks, they take one to four thunder damage and have a chance to be knocked prone, but they need a constitution saving throw of 10. And remember, they already have five stack penalty, so they have a negative five to their roll on that roll to try to save against being knocked prone. And in most cases, you're going to knock them prone. This build is honestly a setup for an absolutely insane min-max build by the time you hit about mid-game. And if you guys would like to see a complete build guide on this one, let me know down there in the comments. And that is it. That is four absolutely insanely broken and OP builds that you can get by the time you hit level four. This is pretty much the earliest set of builds 
that I've been able to come up with that are this incredibly broken. Hopefully you all enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave a comment down below. Let me know what you thought. And if you're looking for some more Baldur's Gate 3 content, you can find a link to another one of my videos on the screen right now. I want to give an absolute massive shout out and thank you to all of my channel supporters for helping to keep these videos a sponsor free. You all are absolutely amazing people. If you would like to become an official channel supporter, check out the links in the description below. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a comment down below. Let me know what you thought. If you're shy, you don't like to comment, just hit that thumbs up button and share your support. Until next time, thanks for watching.